Well, hi everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, May 24th, 2013. Joining me this week, we've got David Dickinson. Hey, David. Hey. We've got Dr. Matthew Francis. Hello. Dr. Francis. Dr. Nicole Gallucci. Who apparently can't spell hangout. Sorry, guys. <laughs> we are hanging out. We're hanging out. Hanging out. <laughs> It's our weekly space hagout. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's pronounced hagu, like ragu. Oh, hagu. I was thinking it's like hagu. Hagu. I'm going to Scotland. Dr. Gallucci. Can you, can you keep it together? All right. Scott Lewis. Hi, everyone. And we've got someone new joining us this week. So Alessandro Springman is at the Arecibo Observatory. Now, Alessandro, we she need can prove it. proof. Prove is it. it. This is so cool. <laughs> That's a scene from Carnival. Uh, yeah. I am in Winsible! So, oh, so with cool. this happening, I'm out for the night. See you guys later. Yeah. I can't compete with so that. You, so, wins. Alessandra, you now officially win the internet. That is so awesome. You but can send means... all gifts and prizes to End of Road 625, Arecibo, Puerto Rico, USA. End of Road. I love End it. End of Road. <laughs> it also means you win 4chan, and I don't know if you want that. So, <laughs> sorry. End of line. <laughs> so, so this week, we're going to be talking about an upcoming conjunction. Uh, a mega galaxy merger. Uh, an upcoming launch from Cape Canaveral. Images of the Oklahoma tornado from space. Uh, an upcoming asteroid miss, and uh, NASA's 3D printing in space. And uh, now you can talk to us, give us your comments, questions, feedback. We're happy to talk to you. The way you can do that, there's a bunch of places. One, if you're watching this on the event page on Google+, go ahead and make your comments there, and we should see them. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can make your comments on YouTube, and uh, you can make your comments on Twitter. Just use the hashtag space hangout. Yep. Yeah. Uh, or if you're watching this sort of on someone's stream in Google+, Plus, we should be able to catch that there. The safest place, if it feels like we're ignoring your comments, is probably over on YouTube. So uh, if you're watching this video embedded somewhere, just click watch on YouTube and then you can go there and then you can share in the wonderful, lively YouTube comments. All right. Where so we can really some... ignore you if we have to. <laughs> we're not, we're not, I, we are not ignoring not you. Exactly. We read every comment and we love them all. All I right. about that. You don't know about us loving them all? What? Yeah. That might be the all Canadian the in you comments? coming out, but that's not the way it is with YouTube comments. We love most of them. <laughs> YouTube nice comments. <laughs> um, all right, well, you know what? I'm going to go to David now, and we're going to talk okay. about the conjunction because time is running out. Yeah, this weekend, uh, the last few days, I've, I've just been able to start following Venus, Mercury, and Jupiter low to the west about 30 minutes after local sunset. Mercury just became visible. I picked it up first with binoculars this past Monday. And I've been tracking it. It should be very close to Venus, like within two degrees of Venus tonight. If you've never seen Mercury, this is a good time to see it because Venus will be the brightest object at about magnitude one point, negative 1.5, I believe it is. Mercury will be fainter than that, and then Jupiter will be above those two. Now, they're going to move into a little triangular grouping about within a five-degree circle of each other. I've heard people say this is the closest grouping since 2026. It, it very well probably is. I haven't had a chance to research to see how true that is, but I don't disbelieve that. So. And so I've heard that this is going to be the closest grouping since t from you know between now and 2021. 2021, somewhere in the next yeah. decade or so. That I that sounds about right. Like I said, I haven't set and actually run the planetarium programs to see how yeah. true that is, but it's going to be a very tight grouping, and like I said, if you've never seen Mercury, this is a good time to try. This is I've one of the... I will admit, I have never seen Mercury. Really? Really? Yeah, well, I have. Yeah. I don't have a really good view to the west, so... This, this is one of the best apparitions of Mercury for uh, dusk apparitions for the northern hemisphere currently, too, the, of this year. Mercury has what they call elongations, where it's, 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 it's maximum distance as seen from the Earth from the sun. It has about five to six elongations per year, but not all of them are equally favorable because Mercury has a very elliptical orbit. Mercury can have an elongation where it's near perihelion, so it's not quite as favorable. In the angle of the elliptic, uh, the ecliptic matters as well. And right now in the summertime, the ecliptic is almost perpendicular to the horizon. So, But, I mean, you really need a nice clear view to the western horizon you to do. really see 
see it. You do. Here in Florida, what what we use instead of hills is I go up in the second story window of uh, in our laundry room and actually look out. That gives me about 20 more feet, you know, about six meters or so elevation so I can actually see. We don't have hills here, so we can't actually go on a hilltop or anything like that. So we- yeah, my, my laundry room is on the basement, so <laughs> that's not going to work for me. Helps if you got a second story floor somewhere you can get a little more elevation around the, the local ground clutter. But it's yeah, getting no, high enough right now that you can actually track them for about 30 or 40 minutes. I was doing photographs of them last night, and I'll probably be doing wow. it again tonight, too. So I yeah, found, no, I've got mountains all the way along the west, but I'm going to be going out yeah. to the west coast in a week, and uh, but they won't be conjuncting again. Will I still be able to see Mercury in a week? Conjuncting. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll still be visible for, for the next week or so with that pairing. Uh, Jupiter is going to be sliding down below the pair pretty soon. The moon in about two weeks will be passing the pair. The moon is full tonight, so new is in about two more weeks. So are we going to be seeing Venus getting higher and higher in the evening yes. sky now? Yes. The, these evening apparitions always come from conjunction on the far side of the sun. So the evening apparitions, Mercury is going to, or Venus is going to be doing a slow climb Kind of similar to what it did when it did the transit uh, pre doing the transit last year, but it's not going to transit this time when it goes in front of the sun. It's and is it going to be close to Jupiter in the coming months? Yeah, the problem is Jupiter is already lower, so we're not going to have that high pairing like we had last year. Yeah, that it's was gonna something. Be, it's going to be slightly lower. About every year and a half or so, we, we get a pairing like that where Jupiter comes back around and pairs up with Venus, and then... Everyone asks me, it's like, what are those two bright stars I see over stars. evening sky? I've never, reading Twitter, when this is, I do this on purpose. I go to Twitter and I put in bright stars in a search for Twitter, and then I just follow. And people are like, huh, how come I never noticed those two bright stars in the sky before? And I respond, because they're planets. I and always then, think it's yeah. interesting, and it kind of shows just the human perception and psychology is how many times people will say, you should have seen how huge it looked, though. And it's like, I know what they mean, is they mean how bright it was. Yeah. But yeah. technically to say how, I was like, well, it's it's not really Venus angular size-wise. It's not huge in visual size. But it's interesting how people will always use that reference when they see a bright object like Venus. Those are ginormous photons, yeah. man. <laughs> Yeah. Um, or you get the situation where, well, like, Venus is right next to the moon, and people are like, I never noticed that really bright star beside the moon before. And you, you know, can like the see moon it. is moving, Venus is moving, they're, it's not even a star. Yeah. <laughs> so and when is Venus, is, Venus is very near the moon, you can see it in the daytime. I've seen Jupiter in the daytime. If you know exactly where to look for it, it is possible. But it's, it's I, a, I like showing people. It's a teachable moment. My, my I saw Sirius is... in the daytime once. Yes. Yeah. That's hard. It is. You've got to know where to look. You yeah. need pristine, clean, clear skies. A very high mountain blue sky helps to do that kind of stuff. My, my favorite is when uh, people are, uh, see the moon during the daytime and they're like, whoa, you can see the moon during the day? Oh, that yeah. is my favorite. Cause it's, it's, right. it's, yeah, it's just being like, observant. It's been, and, it's been yeah. there the entire time. It's, it's, it's your little Venus. one. It's not obvious, but, you know, it's there. Venus is actually intrinsically brighter than the moon. Arc mm-hmm. second per square arc second. Okay. Venus is actually brighter than the moon itself. Wow. And you can't sense. see the moon when it's new in a couple of weeks, but we'll be observing it from Arecibo Observatory. We'll be hitting it with radar. And, oh, very cool. Um, Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia will be receiving the signal that bounces off the moon, as well as the LRO spacecraft in orbit around the moon. So even when you can't see the moon, it's still people are still doing science on it. She's sure. one of my people, you guys. Radio. That's <laughs> right. Radio. But she works in radar, not radio. Thing. Oh, same thing. It's the same thing. So whenever you yell at us, <laughs> they're just same the same. Word. Wavelength. Those words oh, are interchangeable. No. Okay. Damn it. All right, Fraser. High five, Fraser. I walked right into that one. I did yell at you guys for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to move on. We're going to move on. This time we're going to talk about a mega merger from Dr. Francis. All right. Well, uh, so there most. Even though the prettiest galaxies out there are spiral galaxies, um, with those beautiful spiral arms and everything, there's there's a fair number of galaxies that are called elliptical galaxies, which look a lot more boring. But the thing about them is that a, the stars they have in them um, are not the young, bright of you know bright blue stars we often see in spiral galaxies. They, they are of a, a 
on average an older population. And so the question is, when did these galaxies form? Um, based on analysis of the, the population of the stars, we know that a lot of them formed at the same time, and it, this time was a long time ago. So trying to figure out when these galaxies formed and how um, requires looking back, uh, you know, looking, looking into the deep past with, with big telescopes. And the biggest galaxies, the biggest elliptical galaxies in particular, are, have, have provided a bit of a mystery. Um, we haven't seen the progenitors of those galaxies, although there's a good idea that they probably were formed by mergers of smaller galaxies, because how do you make a big galaxy? You collide two smaller galaxies together, and after a while, things um, settle down. And so that's exactly what uh, this new observation found. Um, using data from the uh, unfortunately now defunct, well, mostly defunct Herschel telescope, um, astronomers uh, located two bright galaxies um, in the process of, of merging together. So let me pull up that picture while I'm talking. Um, so what they found is that uh, these galaxies are each individually very bright, there we go. Everybody seeing that? Yep. So uh, um, these are individually very bright galaxies. And then uh, when they are, uh, uh, the, the process of merging means that they're undergoing accelerated star formation. So they're basically going to use up all of the raw materials uh, required to make new stars in a, a relatively rapid period. So, and this collision uh, happened roughly, well, between 10 and 11 billion years ago. So we're just getting the light from it now, but this happened a long time ago, and we're, so we're seeing back into a much earlier period of, in the universe's history. So um, if we can look back and see more of these things, then it, it would pretty much settle the origin of these giant elliptical galaxies, the largest galaxies we know around. So very cool, very interesting result. And uh, you can see the, the picture on the right is a highly magnified version of this. Um, so th that, that bit is just that little tiny blur in the center of the screen. Um, so we are talking about something that's very, very distant, very interesting. But is there any difference between this this object that's you know very far back in time and the kinds of like really big galactic mergers that are going to happen in the future? Like for example, we're going to be colliding with uh, Andromeda in the next ten billion years. Probably going to create a big elliptical galaxy as well. Is there a difference between these these ones that happened when the universe was a lot smaller, a lot more compact than than these days? Well, certainly there there is a difference simply because what we're seeing um, in the the early days. Um, well, okay, let's let's put it this way: uh, the galaxies that we see that are ellipticals today used up all of the raw material to make new stars a long time ago. So they shape their environment very strongly. These these galaxies are are common in in clusters of of galaxies, galaxy clusters. Um, so there is, it's more to do with, you know, what, how, what is the universe that we see today that look the way it does? Um, and we know that we will probably merge with Andromeda some point in the future, um, and it'll probably, the, probably the end result will be an elliptical galaxy. But the thing is, at the time that these galaxies were merging, there was a lot more raw material available for stars to form. So they burned through all of that gas in a period of a few hundred million years. That kind of thing won't happen when we collide with Andromeda. It's going to be, uh, there will be new stars formed. Um, it'll look pretty impressive if, if you could see it, some bug-eyed alien astronomer looking at this whole thing happening from a distance away. They'd see <clears throat> something really incredible going on. But... Uh, yeah, um, so, so basically, um, these, large, these large elliptical galaxies, it, because we know that there's this higher... Or I can't, you can't see me making hands. <laughs> you have to choose. Show us the picture or your cool hand gestures. Here, I'll bring, I can bring my picture back up while you talk. 
No, you use the hand gestures while she's talking and imagine what she's doing. <laughs> Teamwork. And we're on air again. Yeah, we're on air again. All right. This is unfortunately not the first time this has happened this week. Co um, yeah, co oh, coming back from sharing an image. Yes. This has yeah, happened it's pretty memory intensive to share images into. Several hangouts to different hosts. Anyway, what I was trying to get across is we have this picture of hierarchical formation of galaxies. That means from the time of the early universe, you start building small galaxies, and the small galaxies come together to big, big, big galaxies. But we look back and we see these huge, massive elliptical galaxies even in the early universe, and we're not we're still figuring out how they formed. And like Matthew was saying, because it had a lot of this gas, these made intense, this was an intense period of active galaxies. So you have all this gas hitting the supermassive black hole in the center, as well as causing all this star formation. Well, again, when Andr well, like he said, when Andromeda and the Milky Way collide, it's not going to be that as spectacular in that sense. But uh, we're actually seeing this happen in the early universe. And although we've seen the end products of it, it's really important that we see this process as it's happening. Right. Very cool. She put it better than I did. Oh, no. I heart galaxies. She hearts galaxies. All right, so we're going to move to Alessandro and talk about a asteroid that's about to miss us, fortunately. Okay. Well, fortunately, it's about to miss us. Uh, Alessandro is generally accepted pronunciation, but most people just call me Sandy. So Sandy there's a giant. Here on out. Yes, there's a giant asteroid, 1998 QE2, and it's going to pass Earth by about 3.6 million miles on um, the end of next week. And so this is a pretty big asteroid. It's 1.7 miles across. It's a couple kilometers um, in size. How many Rhode Islands is that? I don't remember. <laughs> it's less than one Rhode Island. How many Texas is like that? Hundreds of Rhode Island. Are we in? It's, it's itty bitty. But the metric, the yardstick, we've some people have been using to measure this thing um, since its provisional designation ends in QE two, is uh, Queen Elizabeth II's the Ooh. ocean liners. Nice. So it's about if you lined up nine QE two ocean liners end to end, it would be just as long as this asteroid is long. But this asteroid is a big chunk of rock. It would obviously be a lot bigger than nine cruise ships stacked end to end. So it's coming really close by to Earth, but the exciting thing about this asteroid is it's really big. A lot of asteroids that come by all the time, there may be, we looked at one recently that was five meters across, we've looked at ones that are 100 meters across, a half a half a kilometer across. This one's almost two miles across. So it's going to be really easy to get a good look at it with radar. So most asteroids, when they come past Earth, actually all asteroids, are so small, they're so dim, that we only see them as points of light in our telescope. We can't tell, really, their size. But radar is a really great way to not only improve their orbits, to find out, yes, this thing is not going to come hit us, um, to rule out potential future collisions, but also to take images with radar. So I don't know if you've seen some radar images in the past. Emily Lochtewala has a really great um, post today about radar tracking of asteroids, and she's also got some images on there. But uh, radar is really the only way we have from Earth of taking actual images of asteroids and seeing what they look like. And so, I mean, what kind of resolution do you think we're going to be able to get? We I don't can get like a couple... Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just going to mention, like, I, I remember there's some, there some great radar observations that were made of Ceres a couple of, of years ago, and some, some uh, comets have been done. But, I mean, you know, it's going to get pretty close. You can see it. It's going to get pretty close, and it's really big. And so we can get... Um, it, our resolution actually doesn't have to do with how far away it is, but uh, how quickly you can switch the transmitters that we have here at the observatory or at Goldstone Observatory in California how quickly you can switch them back and forth. And so we can get about seven and a half meter um, resolution here or about three and a half meter resolution at JPL's wow. Goldstone Observatory. It's pretty amazing. So you're seeing yeah. boulders, you're seeing things the size of rooms, the size of cars on the surface of these asteroids. And since this thing is large, we're going to see, is it a, you know, is it one giant, you know, kind of, is it spherical? Is it lumpy? About 20% of the asteroids that we see that come past Earth look like two two lumps stuck together. They look like a lumpy potato. And about 15% have moons. So maybe this Tut thing has a moon. Tutatis looks like that, like a lumpy. Tutatis right. kind of looks like a piece of clay that someone squoze, I think. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, two more ceramics in kindergarten right. reminds me exactly of that. Actually, we hope it has a moon, right? Because that's how we can find its mass. <laughs> Having a moon is a great way to find its mass. The other way you can find its mass is if you've looked at an object for a while, if you've gotten light curves, if you've known its rotation rate, there are a couple of non-gravitational forces, actually, that we know how they'll affect an asteroid. So if you can get its model, if it's, you know its shape pretty well, and you can watch its orbit change, and you can watch um, its spin rate change, you can actually model these... Uh, non-gravitational forces are called the Yarkovsky effect or the Yorp effect. And from those, if you know the shape of the asteroid, you can actually back out the mass that way. So you don't necessarily need a moon to get the mass of an asteroid. And so and so, what's the date that it's going to be flying by? Um, it's going to be coming, uh, we're, we start observing it here on the 30th of May. Uh, Nicole has a link that she's going to be sending out from the JPL press office. And um, it's we're looking at it for a week from Arecibo Observatory. So hopefully, if everything works properly, I'll be um, posting about it on the Planetary Science blog, and I'll also be tweeting about it too. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm Sondy S O N D Y. And David, you, I'm assuming you're going to try and observe it. I was going to ask. Do you know what the visual magnitude is on that? I haven't seen I that. I yeah. don't. Um, but it's coming in pretty close. It might be sort of dark, so it might not necessarily yeah, be a great. I think that's, we might have time on it. Time on some optical telescopes to look at it as well. That's that's like about eight lunar distances, I think, nine lunar distances, something like that. So. Yeah, it's coming but in it's, pretty uh, close. Usually, uh, usually below tenth magnitude is usually a little faint. Uh, I usually don't tell people to observe it unless it's going to be above tenth magnitude because it's just too faint. For well, I'll follow up with you on that one. All right. um, and I also think this one is up at night, so it can be seen by people with normal telescopes and not just big radio ones. All right, well, consider yeah. this a story assignment, David. <laughs> if people no. want to know how I assign stories, that you just watched it happen. Now, now if we have another Chilibinsk incident like the last time we had a, a, another near-Earth asteroid mm -hmm. come by, it wasn't me. <laughs> right. Yeah, awesome. Well, you'll be woken up, trust me. You'll be woken <laughs> I'll up. call you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so Scott, uh, you've got some images of the Oklahoma tornado. Right, so four days we ago. We don't want Nicole to share them because then we would lose her again. Yeah, she's noisy enough, and tornadoes are loud. But four days ago, we had um, that EF5 tornado that oh. went through Oklahoma, and it's insane. Um, it's like having I've seen tornadoes before growing up in Tornado Alley, and it's they're terrifying. But seeing the the aftermath of these, and now we have such great technology now to be able to image these from space, and um, from the Goddard Flight Center uh, Flickr account, they've shared up some images, plus there's an interactive uh, map that I'm going to go to as well. But here is the, you can see the path of the tornado from space. So you see this enormous supercell of thunderstorms going through. And this right here is the actual path of the tornado where it touched down over in Moore County, Oklahoma. And you know, you're seeing this is Texas. You know, this is really you're seeing really high definition coming through here with this enormous, enormous cell of um, of the thunderstorms. So th there is, you know, we have these different satellites up there, and we're trying to find different ways to understand and be able to see what's going on here. So Digital Globe worked and took their data and put it up into a, uh, a Google Maps type thing that's interactive. And, and this is actually from NPR that they put this up. So this streak that I was just showing everyone is this right here. And we can actually get all the way down and get into th where houses were and no longer are. Oh, wow. Look at that. And one thing that they're using this for, which is great, you know, I, I used to work EMS and fire, and being able to see where things were, having this ability to know the infrastructure of a place after, you know, before and after a really bad incident like this allows you to get a scope of what we need to be doing as far as reaction and where we need to, you know, we are able to get this, you know, this is four days. Typically wow. we think of, you know, going Google Earth, we don't know how long ago that's been. This is four days ago that this all happened and you know you can you can zoom in there really well and see just the the onslaught of what a nightmare that's an amazing resource that you found scott that's incredible well this was nancy i love nancy nancy Atkinson <laughs> from universe today but you wow. know you're seeing here there's the freeway you know yeah. and just watching the the path you can see the earth <clears throat> 
the, the change in the earth itself from the powerful winds that are going on as it's just dragging across this county. So you know, a lot of our, our satellite imaging, a lot of There you go. Oh, so it's clearly screen sharing is like the mark of death. Oh, wow. I thought it was amazing when you saw footage of the tornado they were filming from a helicopter. You could see the transformers blowing like out yeah. there, those big flashes of light were all transformers. But, I mean, do you remember, like, in the olden days, like 10 years ago or so, where, you know, there were very rare images of these really powerful tornadoes, you know, and you would see like a couple, they would get used over and over again in various tornado chasing documentaries, but this time around, everybody's got their smartphone, everybody's got a camera all the time, there's so much footage, it's kind of like back to the Chelyabinsk, uh, you know, meteor, because, you know, we had all these Russian road cameras that were capturing, this, you know, we never would have had that 10 years ago, and now suddenly there's all of these, these uh, you know, these cameras out there in the wild. Yeah, and we have all this technology now that, yeah. you know, I, I really I get really frustrated when people say, oh, why are we sending stuff up space? It's not really practical to what's going on here. This is a perfect example yeah. of why we need to continue developing these technologies and ways of, of imaging not only, you know, outside of our planet, but being able to turn it around and, and see what, what's going on here. You know, from a purely, you know, from my previous career, if I had this data for some of the mass casualty incidents I've run on, this would have been priceless. Yeah. And we have this ability to be able to deploy, you know, rescue and be able to find the best places to set up safe zones and and just all sorts of of resources. So, you know, having this technology and be able to continue to develop this as, you know, as a species saying, hey, we need to continue to know what's going on out there and we'll be able to help ourselves out in the process of, of gaining more understanding. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to be able to see within days of this event happening, high-resolution photographs showing from space of the trail of the tornado is, is just amazing. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's one of the most powerful sort of space sets of images I think I've ever seen. Just amazing. Man, I, I really sort of hope the people from Oklahoma are able to recover and, and get right. back on their feet. It's pretty devastating. It was a pretty awful tragedy. And, and thinking about it, it's something that actually has been on my mind a lot lately, is that people think of space satellites as something you know abstract, obscure, nothing that interacts with their daily lives. And you can see... You can see the homes yourself. You don't have to wait for the news to come on. You can actually go onto your computer and see firsthand how this has affected other people. It's something that I believe has really allowed humanity to connect with one another from across the world. And ha we have this ability now to see the, the aftermath and what, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And that's, that's insanely powerful, not just technology-wise, but on, in a human perspective. That's insanely powerful. So we've got a couple of questions and comments back on the asteroid that Sandy mentioned. Um, so first, uh, now you actually posted back on Twitter that the magnitude is going to get to 11 on yes. June 1st, right? Yes. Um, but it's probably going to be, uh, it's, I looked for like a couple of places in California, I think it's going to be much more in the southern hemisphere. So you're going you're gonna to have to be a little more better uh, located. If you know how to use the JPL Horizons interface to yeah, look for cool. asteroids, um, you can use that. Um, if you don't know how to, tweet me with your location, and I can look up where okay. you are and say whether or not you'll be able to look at this asteroid. But it's going to be really bright. So if you have a small telescope, you'll probably be able to see it if you're in the right location. And uh, Michael Jobin uh, asks, if NASA could capture a small asteroid, could they give it a safe re-entry for a close study? So. When he, I guess when he says safe reentry, would there be any way you could re-enter a mile-long asteroid in a way that wouldn't cause a lot of destruction? Or burn up at the outer surface so you've already changed the asteroid itself? Well, so I mean, you know, that that thing comes crashing into Earth. If you bring a mile-long asteroid to Earth and it comes in with any sort of velocity, it's going to create a ten-mile-wide crater. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and a, and, a, and then there was also a very interesting thing that even if you had a mile long metal asteroid or metal sphere on the surface of the Earth, it would be so massive that it would crack the Earth's crust and descend towards the core. And a couple of geophysicists have decided this is the best idea ever for looking at what the Earth is made of, and you could put something inside of it that would thump 
and it would transmit information back to the Earth's surface by seismic thumping. So, so even if you did bring back a one mile wide asteroid to the Earth, it would crack the crust and. So make oh, this a wow. mile long, hurl <laughs> it at the yeah. Earth, and see so what happens. Make so it smaller, it put it in a capsule. Yeah. <laughs> just so just, saying, just you know, it's chip an, off chunks. It's an okay idea. Maybe maybe not your best idea, Michael. Maybe try something <laughs> something else. Well, you know, they just leave it in orbit. Chip off chunks, Park it around right? the moon. Park it around the moon. But it would be so convenient. It'd be so easy to access it as it was sinking down into the core. You could like try and mine it a little as it... <laughs> it's like you're steeping a key bag. You know, you're like, you, oh, well, let's just see what's going on. Is yeah. it if you had a one-mile-sized asteroid on the surface of the Earth, you would you would, you would have some other problems aside from should we mine it? But um, right, I mean, so if you had a global destruction from the impact and the the sort of the winter that would happen for the next couple of decades, Crazy. the loss like why of, you're not in lots charge of vegetation of on Earth and. You'd have 99 problems, and studying it probably would not be one. Right. But with a smaller asteroid, back when the space shuttle was actually in service, there was talk about, you know, you could take a small asteroid, you could, you know, lasso it, put it put it on a leash, bring it back, put it in the space shuttle cargo bay, and bring it back to Earth. But it'd have to be pretty small, because, as we all know, metal is really dense, so if it was right. a stony asteroid, it would still weigh a lot, but you could at least start thinking about bringing something a little smaller home. This is why NASA is talking about bringing home a pet rock on a leash, putting it in orbit near the Earth, and having astronauts go visit it because it's a little easier than getting it to the surface of the Earth. Oh, I'm leave pet it rock. up in space <laughs> so we can. Who's a good asteroid? Who's a good yeah, asteroid? asteroid. Our yeah. 80s are showing. It's yeah. kind of nice. Pet rock. <laughs> even yes. even it's like it's dropping it into the ocean would be even worse. Yeah. Yeah, then you think you're, think you're gonna like, you know, park it in the ocean, that's not gonna help. So if we put this out in space, can we put big googly eyes on it? <laughs> I think Red totally eyes. Can. <laughs> I'm not in my office right now, but my light switch has googly eyes on it and I'm just, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to another story now, I have decided. I think we needed that laughter after the previous one, so Yeah. Uh, so David, this is a really cool story that you worked on, which is NASA's working on a three D printer for pizza, for food. Yeah, there was actually NASA just awarded a contract this earlier this week, hundred twenty five hundred contract home to research. A 3D printer that would print pizza base that would actually go to the ISS and be able to print players oh, on the You have some latency issues, David. Yeah, we can't hear a word you're saying. Well, we can hear the words you're saying, oh. but they're. We hear every other syllable. How about, how about now? Good. Hey, Don't move. Yeah, okay. It's uh, NASA awarded a $125 million contract earlier this week to act for a company to design a 3D printer that they're looking at actually printing a pizza layer by layer of having the dough and then have the ejector do the tomato sauce and then do what they were talking about is putting the protein layer on the top. Now, what was interesting is the protein layer, the, the uh, matrix they were talking about using was uh, algae, seaweed, and insect protein. So I don't know how uh, mm. how yummy this type of pizza is going to be. But it kind of gets to the old idea of what, if they're going to go on longer-term missions to Mars, what they're actually going to be able to eat in space. They're going to be craving their insect pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, so that's taking tofurkey to another level. And you know, the, the, first, the first thing I wasn't entirely clear on, when the first thing I thought when I read this, I was like, how are you going to 3D print a pizza in zero G without having tomato sauce? flying around in lobules and things like that. There actually have been, because uh, they are flying a 3D printer at the International Space Station next year. There's a company called Made in Space that is doing 747, uh, the equivalent of the Vomit Comet type flights, and they are doing micro-G experiments with uh, 3D printers that they are going to ship up there. This one isn't uh, scheduled to print food. It's going to be more as a kind of a proof of concept of print, like basic parts and things like that on site on the International Space Station. But you may see these more. What I think is interesting is RipRap, the print company called RipRap, actually has a 3D printer that can print itself. It can print the parts necessary. So you the, know, the singularity is about to happen. So yeah. the von Neumann machines, the yeah. von Neumann machines are just about here. Uh, yeah, send in the berserkers. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it can print part of itself. It, it can't, I don't think it one can print itself. Yeah. 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 Don't give it any yeah. way to plug itself in. That's it. If, if long Next as month, it's Cyberman. Like, plug itself in, then we're fine. That's what a decade away. 
I'm hearing like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. Um, right. So now you said 125 million. Is that right? 125 million? Oh, 125,000. Ah, yeah. Okay, that's a different number. Yeah. One would have people rioting in the streets and petitioning yeah. their congressman, and the other one no. would be like, yeah, yeah, you know, who wouldn't want some uh, bug pizza? 125,000 for a six-month grant, and the company is Systems and Materials Research Corporation. That's designed. And NASA's actually been working on 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 this kind of stuff. They've been working on. Uh, artificial meat as yes. well. Printing you know, meat and oh, it's, it's yeah, it's, but you can really see it. You hear about that $250,000 hamburger? <laughs> right. You hear about that? Yeah. I mean, they're, uh, no, no. they're one, growing beef. One, that one, way. Thing, one thing they know from Biosphere 2 from the experiment there is uh, they're not going to be able to raise animals on a trip to Mars. Uh, they're not going to be able to have chickens or cows or anything like that. So, your basic source of protein might be uh, what they call micro ranching. It might be insects. <laughs> bugs. It's <laughs> bugs. Algae, kale, or not kale, but uh, just basic, yeah, yeah protein. Kale, plankton. Is kale is a plant. <laughs> yes, bug girl. The, the bug reason girl I, would be glad to, oh, to yes. tell us all about how delicious bugs are. The, the reason I had kale on the brain is Elon Musk recently tweeted to PETA saying that he would not be the kale king of Mars. And uh, when he was he was talking about Martians might be Martian colonists might be vegetarians, PETA had tweeted back to him and said, "Well, don't you mean that they would be vegan?" So it's like that discussion's kind of already out there of what kind of diets would uh, a Mars One type mission. Right. We would be we would eat <laughs> Martians. <laughs> I will eat kale on Mars. Me too. I would eat kale. I would eat kale, kale, would eat kale to go to Mars. I, I'd eat kale today. I grow kale. Yeah. Delicious. <laughs> guys, 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 guys. But this means we're going to have replicators soon and we're going to be more like Star Trek. <laughs> that's it. That's yes. what That's what matters is that that's we're going to have replicators. And I can ask for tea, Earl Grey, hot. And... It, it'd be and interesting to it would be interesting to see if we have food replicators in our kitchens in a decade or so. Yeah. Uh, if, people are, if the human element is going to take to the technology or not. Right. All the Star Trek fans will. Well, have you seen, there's a, there's a guy on the internet, which, you know, this can't end well, is, um, is making a thing called Soylent. Have you seen about this? He's oh, like, yes. Yes. He's I worked like, that into the article. Yeah. Did you work that into the article? Uh, the, well, I worked the, the, the reference to Soylent Green. Oh, okay. Yeah, is, it, is it people? Please tell me it's people. It's people. Reference too, but the gist is he's, he's like trying to boil down human nutrition down into the absolute raw Essentials Wait, and literally, is literally humans. He's yeah. boiling down. No humans. no humans in it. Uh, human nutrition, the requirements for human survival, okay. and it's you know it's got like I don't know the right amount of carbohydrate and protein and fat and the various essential nutrients and micronutrients and so on. And he's just made this drink that he drinks. And but does it taste like chocolate? He it seems to love like it. Chocolate. He seems to crave it. And, uh, I'm you know, sure you but... crave it once you have a human. <laughs> of course you crave it. Yes, I know. And that's how <laughs> Soil and Green happens. Well, the, the company that's designing this 3D printer is hoping it will take off commercially as well. So I don't know if we'll be printing Domino's pizza pretty soon. It'll probably take more than 30 minutes, so I don't know if it'd really be worth to print a pizza at home. You won't have to tip it, though. I should invest <laughs> in some kind of a bug farm right now. Yes. Because sure. that's going to well, be bigger. the seventeen-year cicadas are hitting the east coast. There's plenty of there harvest. Go. Right, there you go. There's, There's a, a lot of some kind of cicada farm, farm where where every couple of years your bugs come out and then you stick them into the replicator. <laughs> right, <laughs> but it, is that really what it is? When you think about like when, you know when when Captain Picard is asking yeah. for I don't know they put tea, matter in it, and matter comes out. He's really getting is just. Bugs. What's the matter with that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love it. You know, most oh, yeah. pro, most prote most processed foods already have uh, a few. Uh, there, there is an acceptable limit of how many bug parts are in, like peanut butter and things like right. that. So yes, we're probably already eating bugs. Yeah. Oh, no, well, uh, we are. It, yeah, it's not probable. I'm, this is how much. Do you ride a bike? If you ride a bike, you eat bugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, we need Bug Girl in this episode so badly. There you go. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Francis, please tell us about a new measurement to SS Cygni. Okay, well, there's a uh, certain type of uh, binary system um, known as a recurrent nova. Um, you think of a supernova as something, you know, big, big explosion that you can see halfway across the universe, uh, literally in some cases. But uh, there's also smaller things that don't 
actually destroy their uh, destroy the system, and and one type is a recurrent nova. Um, SS Cygni is one that's not too far from the solar system. It consists of a red dwarf, which is a star smaller than the sun, and a white dwarf, which is you know the remnants of a star like our sun. Um, according to theory. Uh, the white dwarf strips gas off of the red dwarf, falls on to the, the white dwarf, but the temperature is low enough that, okay, stars are, are plasma, but the, the temperature is low enough that the, uh, the electrons can rejoin with the atoms, and that creates a big outburst of energy. So that's what causes this recurrent nova. The problem is, in 1999, Astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope measured a distance to this system called SS Cygni um, and found that it was too far away. In other words, it appeared to be hotter than would be expected from that theoretical model I described. It's too hot for the electrons to join with the protons. So that was a problem because that led people to wonder, okay, do we have the model wrong? That's a big, that's a big, uh, big issue. So, um, so another group of astronomers using uh, the Very Long Baseline Array, VLBA, uh, got to say that for Nicole's sake, radio astronomy, and then the uh, European uh, Very Long Baseline Interferometry Network, EVN, that's a mouthful. Um, that one. That one's a nested acronym. Yes, so. it's a, it's a recursive. Not, not, I guess not a recursive. But it, yes, it is a nested it's acronym. Nested. Um, but it was. A, yeah, they. What they did is they did a a new measurement. Um, the nice thing about a system like SS Cygni is, unlike an ordinary star, uh, it has. It's pretty bright in radio light, and. I didn't know any of this, by the way. I'm a, I'm a cosmologist. I'm not, I'm not a, an astronomer type dude. So um, it turns out that you can actually get a little more accurate distance measurement using radio telescopes if you've got a good radio source because you can calibrate the distance using an extra galactic source. Whereas if you're using visible light, you have to kind of take an average over positions of of nearby stars. And so what they found is this revised uh, distance measurement using radio telescopes uh, brought it well within the range of what would be reasonable for this theoretical model. Of course, now we're left with the mystery of why the visible light Hubble Space Telescope estimate was so different. So assuming the radio uh, measurement is more accurate, which my un untutored uh, 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 opinion seems it seems like it, it's it's pretty accurate they seem to have done a, a pretty thorough job why the Hubble measurement is so far off so we'll, we will not we have not heard the last of SS Cygni I think but these I mean if I understand correctly right these are you've got like a white dwarf star and you've got another larger object that and the white dwarf is siphoning material off the the larger star right, right? And as the material builds up on the white dwarf, it gets to a certain point, and then it flares off, and you see these these nova eruptions. But I mean, isn't that also sort of how a a uh, type one a supernova is formed, where you get a white dwarf that gets to a point that it you know passes the was the the limit, the one point four times the mass of the sun, and then yeah, that's that's going to be true if the white dwarf is near that mass limit to begin yeah. with. But uh, most white dwarfs are are not quite that big. So um, in I think fact, this, in this case, it's it's the um, it's it's helium fusion that sets off the nova. Yeah, well, that would be it's not, that would, it's not reaching the mass limit. It's it's the fusion. Right. Okay. Runaway, yeah, runaway not, fusion. No, no, it's it's recombination in this case. Okay. SS Cygni is is uh, electrons rejoining the protons. Oh. Um, there is another cut type of of nova that is helium fusion on the surface okay. of the white dwarf, and that's a system where it's very hot. Mm -hmm. um, this is a rel. Okay, it's funny to talk about it being you know, this being cold, um, but it's uh, you know it's it, it's all relative, relatively speaking here. But it is it it's a it's a much colder system, too cold for fusion to happen, and so the outbursts are when it reaches 
when the temperature gets too low instead of too high. So um, this is a much gentler system than anything that we'd be comparing to a type 1A supernova. Uh, um, so gentle. Yeah, relatively speaking. Yeah. Relatively so, speaking, too. One of the most powerful explosions in the universe. Yeah, it's, a, yeah, well, it's, it's not like this is... It's yeah. not like this is... Uh, I mean, the, the thing, too, that's kind of cool about this story is that the astronomers recruited a group of uh, amateur astronomers to help them monitor this as part of a citizen science project. So they, they kept an eye on the SS Cygni system. When the flare began, they would ping the radio astronomers who would then, you know, trigger... The uh, these these ne these vast networks of radio telescopes to uh, to try to to get a, a handle on their location so on on the distance to the the system so it was a pretty cool thing pretty cool project. <laughs> All right, so one last story, uh, a quick one here. Uh, now, David, you put this on the on the docket. I'm not sure. So there's there's not going to be an eclipse. There there is an eclipse, and no one's going to see it. There is a an umbral eclipse in a few hours. There's uh, always an eclipse that no one sees. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 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 a penumbral eclipse when the moon goes through the outer part of the Earth's shadow, which is very bright. If you ever watched a penumbral eclipse, they are very slow. And this one is the first one on this sorrow cycle, so it's going to be only about two percent inside of the Earth's outer shadow. So it's going to be too subtle to see right about it's midnight about East Coast time here. It only lasts for about 20 minutes. But it was interesting to write about because this one actually starts a new Soros cycle, Soros being a period of 18 years, 11 days, and 6 hours where eclipses follow the same series of patterns. And it lasts for about 1,200 years each Soros cycle. Wow. Um, so when do we get to see an awesome lunar eclipse? Not until tax day, American tax day next year, we get a total lunar eclipse, different Soros. There's about 41 Soros is active right now. That's so April, April 14th, 15th, right? 15th, yes. Yeah. There's one North and South America we'll see. There, there are two more lunar eclipses. This year's a bad year for eclipses, actually. It's been a bad couple of years, there, yeah. There, there are two more lunar eclipses on the next... Oh, there's one more lunar eclipse, actually, on the next lunar eclipse season at the end of this year, but it's going to be another penumbral. The only thing interesting you can do during a penumbral, if it's a deep penumbral, is I've taken photos of the full moon... Uh, before it goes into eclipse, during eclipse, and after. And if you can compare them, you do see a little bit. The moon looks like a light brown instead of white uh, when it's in a um, normal eclipse. But you're still, still not making it interesting enough, I think. It's, it's not. It's, it's probably the, the ultimate non-eclipse. And this one is going to be so shallow yeah. that it's not going to be noticeable. But it, so is, it, is interest, it is interesting that we're starting a new sorrow cycle. But we will, I'm sure, be doing live coverage of, uh, of the one next year. It'll be amazing. I Interestingly love enough, stories about how the IRS is blocking out the moon. <laughs> so we have the supermoon stuff we have to deal with, plus we're going to have... Right. Oh, is it time to debunk supermoons? Uh, oh, David, could you the, write a bunch of the, bunking supermoon oh, articles, please? I, I, I'll recycle my supermoon. Yeah, <laughs> just, in my recycle, just bring it back up again. No. Apparently, we were just talking about before we started the show, it's, it's, a, it's starting to be like the Mars hoax, where almost every full moon is a supermoon. And it's uh, astronomers dislike the term, but of course we all write about it because it gets high SEO hits I, when we write yeah. about it. So it's it's, it's uh, a cool term. And it's a I mean it is cool. I mean I, when the moon when the moon is, you know, at its closest point, it is visibly larger in the sky and much brighter. This is a this is a real thing. It is a and super it has moon. a cape and tights, which is, it is a called super the supermoon. It has got soul and it's super moon. <laughs> yeah. I, I prefer I prefer perigee or proxygean moon, but no uh, apparently, proxygen and moons just fall no, off. The, no, like, we're going with super so moon. Nobody says proxygen yeah. anymore. So. But and it's a teachable moment, David. Every time it a person is. shows it up, is. going, "I wonder how the super moon is going to affect yeah. my behavior," we say it's not, and then you we can, explain why. And then you can talk about the moon illusion, how the moon looks bigger on the horizon, but it's actually the same size. And, and uh, well, actually, we're going to have a series of them because this moon tomorrow is tonight. It's fairly close. The yeah. close one is June, June full moon, and then the July one's going to be fairly close too. But the moon comes just about almost as close every yeah. lunation. So, <laughs> fantastic. That's great. All right. Well, I think we're out of time, so why don't we start wrapping things up? So uh, we're gonna let the uh, our newbie give us uh, give us some more information. So, Sandy, where do people find out more about you? 
apart um, from the address that you gave, which is at the end of the road in <laughs> Arecibo, which I'm not sure that sounds legit, but yeah, where do we find out more? It's uh, That's what you give to UPS and FedEx. It works great. Um, so uh, you can go to the JPL website. They have a fantastic press office there. We're sort of a bare bones operation. The NSF has been threatening to cut us off for a long time, so we don't we don't have nice things like a press office or a press oh, person. Nice. Um, I'm on Twitter. I will be posting all sorts of links and retweeting things. Um, Emily Lochtwala of the Planetary Society is a great resource. So if you go to planetary.org, there's a lot there. And I might even link to something from my own website, which is really easy. It's sandy.com. And uh, you can find out more there. And space You've been iterating for a long time, haven't you? You've got the early Twitter. you got a good domain name. She's got a good name for it. Yeah. <laughs> Break yeah. out. <laughs> All the Nicoles were gone, but Sandy was not one. I couldn't get Nicole.com. Yeah. I think I got Sandy.com 99, 2000. Yeah. Back when you could register domain names for free. <laughs> Those were the days. Yeah. So if you know, follow me on Twitter, there's a bunch of other resources for finding out about these asteroids, and uh, we try to find them before they find you. And uh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Your tax and, dollars and, at work. Thank you. And Those thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for doing us that amazing view of the Arecibo Observatory. Well, well, we can do it once amazing. more. Yeah. Yay. It's just started raining oh, yeah. a couple of minutes ago. Oh, we heard thunder, yeah. <laughs> wow. Yay. That's fantastic. Awesome. All right, David, where do we find out more of David Dickinson? He's I am, I am tweeting and mocking all after that.com. I'm on. He's at Garble Garble Garble. <laughs> Garble, Garble. <laughs> I'll do this forum. You can see more David Dickinson. He writes at he's Astro Guys on Twitter, and he also uh, writes a whole bunch for uh, Universe Today. There you go. Yeah. So don't listen to his computer uh, simulation. Exactly what he said. <laughs> Dr. Matthew Francis, aka can, uh... the Bowler Hat Science. Yes, so find me at bowlerhatscience.org, galileospendulum.org, that's my science blog. Um, Twitter at Dr. M. R. Francis, that's Dr. not Mister? Dr. Mister. Dr. Mister. Mister. Not, not Dr. Mister. <laughs> it's, that's how I read it. You, you, you're going to start me itself. singing Mr. Mister songs again. Um, <laughs> and then uh, various other places, Ars Technica, BBC Future, New Yorker blog. All right, Dr. Nicole Gallucci. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Noisy Astronomer. I live at CosmoQuest. Uh, you can find me at uh, CosmoQuest.org, at NoisyAstronomer.com, at uh, I blog for Discovery News occasionally, um, all over the interwebs. You've escaped Universe Today's grasp so far. That's because every time you 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 start to say you should write, and then you go wait, then Pavel. No, wait, no, no, you shouldn't. That's right, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You're already doing too much. Yeah, you're busy. You're busy. You're busy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. All right, Scott Lewis. Yes, um, I am on Twitter at Ball Astronomer. My website is knowthecosmos.com. I'm all over Google Plus uh, Virtual Star Party, which is every Sunday night with my co-host Fraser Kane. And we are now we now have uh, that also on Twitter and Facebook as well. It's the underscore BSP on Twitter and yeah. Facebook.com/slash Virtual Star Party, where we hook up telescopes to a Google Plus Hangout and share the view of the universe to them. I've heard of it. Awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. So we do that Sunday Sometime night in Florida Florida. on the West Coast. So around, I think we're about 9 o'clock Pacific Standard Time now. So, yeah. Of course, I am Sorry, at Universe Today, although you mostly don't see my writing there on Universe Today anymore. So. Because you have minions. I've been doing videos on YouTube, and I'm doing a lot of stuff, yeah, virtual star parties and stuff. So, But you can see my invisible hands pulling the strings behind <laughs> everything that's going on. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that sounds so evil. <laughs> From Vancouver Island, Fraser Kane, dance puppets, dance. <laughs> okay, well, thanks everybody for watching this week. Really appreciate it, and we will see you on Sunday night for the Virtual Star Party. Yeah. Thanks for everybody who joined the panel this week. It was great, and uh, we'll see you all next week.